Hey there, No Labels, No Limits podcast listeners. Sarah Box here, your host, and I'm so excited to introduce you to Angela Nesbitt. Angela is the founder and CEO at Jaziri, and Angela helps her clients develop their leadership skills and presence in a time of accelerating change, and boy, don't we know that there's a lot of change going on right now. So most of her clients are really wanting to successfully navigate complex and difficult conversations, reconcile conflicting or ambiguous priorities, and help their teams rapidly coalesce and implement solutions. And I will say I agree with one of Angela's gifts is to help other people achieve their goals where there really is no roadmap and clarify their values and priorities. And she has this unique combination of gifts of being very analytical and insightful and very open. And I will tell you that Angela and I have had a few separate conversations and I always come away excited because she just makes me think of new things. And then I have to call her back so we can have more conversations. So I'm happy to be able to share her with you today. And let me ask you to start at off, Angela. I know that you grew up in Nairobi, and then you graduated from Dartmouth and then followed up by graduating graduating from Wharton Business School after that, and then you took out time to raise your daughters. Then you were principal at Mercer Companies, and you worked with Towers Perrin, World Bank, and Commercial Bank of Africa. That tells me alone how much transition and change you've navigated in your life. So I'm wondering if you could start out by just sharing with us, how did you make that jump and decide to go from Nairobi to Dartmouth and Wharton? Oh my. Well, I thought I was going to go to university in England. And my father suggested that I apply to somewhere in the States. And I just thought he must have been crazy because this was back in the 70s. And as far as I knew, America was either burning in race riots or everyone was a drug addict. So I I couldn't imagine why I'd go to America. But I went to this very rural area in New Hampshire and found out that Americans are much more conservative than I realized. It was a big change going to a men's college, that's for sure, back in the 70s. And... I guess at that time in my life, I made changes, but maybe I wasn't so conscious of it going through it. I wouldn't allow myself to feel the change until after I've done it. And that was a habit that I continued through lots of changes. I went back to Kenya, then came back to business school in this country, and then moved to New York City to work. And I got through a lot of life by being very disconnected from my emotions nothing below my neck sort of got through. And that eventually caught up with me, especially when I um, later, I was raising kids, became aware that of my self-talk, essentially that voice that was talking and talking, 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 and it wouldn't shut up and it wasn't helpful. And until I learned to be aware of it and to be more conscious about how I talk to myself, I'd become a prisoner. I was, I was a prisoner until I could make that change. And making that change then changed my career as well. So how did you learn to make that change? Oh, I essentially went through some courses. The Pacific Institute, and this, was, this is a company that focuses primarily on it, with companies, but I managed, I think my small company, I managed to get into some program with theirs. And I mean, they train elite military forces and uh, elite athletes and uh, Olympic, um, Olympic athletes, uh, the Chinese um, gymnasts, I think, have gone through a course. So they, yeah, they teach you to be able to think more effectively. You know, you know, you know sometimes you're watching at the Olympics and you'll see a swimmer sit there by the pool and got a headset on and you think they're in their own world. Well, essentially they are practicing every move through that, that swim before they get into the water. And that was some of the training that I was a beneficiary of. 
and then and then went on to teach others. So I have two questions you may not know the answer of. Did you ever ask your dad why he wanted you to go to the States? You know, he, he was a, in some ways quite contradictory. He, uh, he thought I should spread my wings. And he, he had been in the States before. So before that, so he spent six months on what's called the Eisenhower Fellowship, which allowed him to travel the country to further develop his career as a physician. So, but I, I did not ask him that directly. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you came here and knew he wasn't throwing you to the wolves once you got here. <laughs> yeah. Well, think of as a young woman, I would have had the same thoughts. You yeah. know, like, are you kidding me? You're sending <laughs> what? Where? To do what? <laughs> I know. <laughs> and even then, the media was not nearly as pervasive as it is today. And so you think about what got filtered that came your way. Um, I know, all I knew is what Life Magazine <laughs> and Hollywood had to say about America. Yes. Not good. <laughs> Not a full representation, yeah. then or now. Yeah. So, so, was it after that training that you decided to start your own business? Oh, let's see. Well, I I had my, a small business that I'd created so I could stay home with my kids, and but it was after that training that I realized that. I, I could do things more differently. And I, and I was not as committed. I didn't have to be as committed to the past. I could create my future. So yes, it was from that training that I then, well, I went into some boutique consulting, um, helping companies create high performance cultures. And then eventually, you know, what happened was I was doing consulting work and a few of my clients uh, described me as their coach. I got what is that? And, um, but that's what, that was the impetus that sent me into executive coaching. Nice. So one of the things you and I had talked about in one of our early conversations was the whole topic of conversational intelligence. I don't know if you remember that or not, but it was pretty interesting to me in the whole piece of the work that you do, and also the your emphasis on the power of words, how impactful yeah. words are. Can you share and talk about what conversational intelligence is and why, in your opinion, words matter so much? Oh, yeah. When I came across this, this was a game changer. This is a concept that has been described and researched by uh, the late Judith E. Glazer. And, um, she has a book of the same name. So why is it so important? Um, well, words create worlds. And I don't know if she quoted that or some other very intelligent person. But the words we use create the pictures of our reality. And uh, so I, I had appreciated that from this previous work that I'd learned from the Pacific Institute. But one of the things that I learned from studying with Judith is that those words actually affect the chemical reactions going in our body. They affect how we think. They go so far as to affect our genetic expression, how our genes turn on and off. And oh my goodness, this is really important. How we talk to ourselves, how we talk to others either brings us together or takes us apart that uh, really, you know, I've seen microscopic pictures of our cellular structure based on how, what our thought patterns are doing to us ourselves. And if we are in connection, if we're spending time in connection with others, our cellular structure is much more healthy and integrated than if we're not, if we are belittling others or in a belittling environment, if we're in conflict or um, constant ambiguity, it is actually affecting how our body works, let alone how our brain functions. And yeah. how long does it take for that to impact? So for instance, you and I are pretty simpatico right now in a conversation, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing if 
I'm w- asking if we were being monitored right now, I, mm-hmm. either of us, would those cellular changes be happening right now or are they delayed and they happen after? Well, cellular change takes a bit longer than a 10 minute conversation. But if we were being monitored, if somebody was to hook up our brains, they would right. start to see that at our brains, uh, the waves in our brains are um, in sync. And this is probably most pronounced if you uh, were to hook up people in an orchestra, they sort of create like this one mastermind um, of all these brains in sync. And as you and I are talking and as we're in sync, the chemicals, the physiology of our body, the, the, the chemicals that are being poured into our blood system and being metabolized are moving towards making us more healthy and make, moving us towards having a higher functioning thinking pattern. But if, if there was some disagreement, if there was some ang- ambiguity, if there was some open conflict, then the chemicals in our body would be pouring out things that are essentially over time are toxic and we would have less and less access to the higher thinking parts of our brain and we would be operating more at a primitive level, if that makes sure. sense. That makes perfect sense. It also leads me to ask you or to ask you to describe how each of those things matter to leaders and entrepreneurial success in terms of beyond the chemistry, like how do you use that knowledge, right, of what we're creating with our words and our engagement to build success either with individuals or with organizations or teams? Well, at the most simplistic level, there are two chemicals in our body to care about. There there are many, but I'm just going to reduce it down to two. There's one called oxytocin and the other one called cortisol. And oxytocin, just remember, that's what makes you feel good. It's the love chemical. It is produced when you are in relationship with somebody else. You can't produce it essentially by yourself. You have to be in relationship for it to be poured into your blood system. And uh, so if you are in a situation where things are going well in relationship and you're feeling good and you're producing good stuff and having great conversation, oxytocin is being poured into your blood system. But if you are under too much stress, if there is um, unnecessary criticism, um, if there's aggression, if there's something to put us on alert that it could be dangerous, cortisol is put into our blood system. And excess cortisol shuts down our brain, the way we can think clearly, be able to solve problems, and puts us into the fight or flight or flee modes Now, here's one of the things to remember that if you have a cortisol dump into your system, it takes maybe 25 hours for your body to metabolize it. That's if you don't keep on remembering. Every time you remember that awful incident, that awful argument, you get that blood, you get that stuff in your blood system again. If you have a little bit of a love fest, that lasts, I don't know, four to five hours. So you need to have five to seven times as many good things coming at you as bad things just to stay ahead of the game. And as you get into, as you have more oxytocin in your system, that that cocktail is more heavily loaded towards oxytocin, that's when you can think at your best. That's when you can collaborate. That's when you're the most creative. And That's what you need when you're trying to solve a difficult problem. When you're trying to work with a group of people where there is no roadmap and you're you're sort of feeling your way into something, that's what you need when you've made an innovation, but you need to have the group, excuse me, need to have the group come together and actually implement. You have to land the idea down on the ground and you need to have that safety net for the group to work. So you often see in companies, they might have great ideas, but they can't, they have no landing gear. And so build the landing gear. I'm sorry. Can you build the corporate or the cultural landing gear? Yes. You build it corporate culture. I'm defining corporate culture as 
the thinking patterns and behaviors that you need to exhibit to be successful in that environment. So it's particular to that organization, right? Yes. So now you might have a corporate culture that keeps um, to be successful in that organization. You might have a you might have a corporate culture that keeps everyone tamped down. So that's that's a low performing culture. But if you had two, you could have two very high performing cultures, but they, they, they are different. So let's say a high performance culture for a hospital, for example, think of a really good hospital and a high performance culture for a technology company like Apple, very different cultures, but they can still be high performing because they are allowing and expecting employees to perform at a higher level. So I think that that allowing along with the expecting is kind of the magic potion. Yes, and and there are lots of um, things you can look at and measure, but to create it. Um, but yes, you said it simply. So you've talked about some of the things that help people succeed, and one of them were one of those things are systems. So mm-hmm. can you share how systems will help someone succeed? Oh, um, so systems. Uh, sort of like a structure to take some of the thinking out, you know, the day-to-day having to think through a process. So you can have a, a system on how you get out of bed and into your car to go to work. You know, you just, you, you have a system. You can have um, uh, systems um, in an organization that be more complex. Like who makes decisions when, how do you pass things along? So these are there to make our lives simpler and easier so that we can then take our more uh, discretionary thinking to solve the unexpected, if that makes sense. Absolutely, because you're basically saying the things we don't have to think deeply about, we can systematize. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And I think we're pretty familiar with that. Like just in our personal lives, we don't really think about getting up and I don't have to consciously think, am I going to brush my teeth today? It's like, I am going to, you know, it's like, that's just who I am. Right. Well, And I don't think about really, I don't have to think too much about how to drive other than being alert. The other stuff is just there. Right. Yeah. I mean, you you know, your your hand goes to the ignition it just turns on, you put the, it into gear and you lock and yeah. Right. Because those are kind of become automatic or their system. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think more basically, like I always have my person keys in the same place. So I'm not standing there going, okay, yeah, where the heck is this stuff? Yeah. yeah. So, but those little micro things, but I think in a corporate or a business or an organizational, having those systems, whether they're for, how do you do accounting or how do you bring new people into the organization or how do we talk to customers? Those kinds of things, once they're in a system, really does allow people to do what you hired them for, which is their creative and their contribution work. And now, when you have a change, the system is going to stop the change. And whether it's inside of ourselves, and you know, we are hardwired to prevent change. So you wake up in the morning, you don't have to think about brushing my teeth. I don't have to think about how, like, how does Angela behave? Like, Angela knows how to behave. And you just keep going. Like, now, if I deliberately try to interrupt this system I've created to become a different person, for example, um, I want to add some more exercise into my life, or I want to pick up a, a new habit to make me more effective. The system's going to say, uh-uh, that's not how we do it. And you know, one of the things I teach people is how to deliberately overcome that so that the, bot, so that the systems inside of me say, oh, that's who we are? Okay, we don't, fine. And then that's the new habit. It's, a, it's the same in companies, only it's much more complicated. And here's another thing to think about. If people are grooved, into a habit, into a system with a lot of fear embedded into it, that 
that uh, and a lot of negative emotion when it comes time to change even if the change is better they won't change but if you groove it, this habit or a system with let's say a lot of oxytocin you, you like what you're doing when it's time to change there isn't that as much resistance to taking a new path okay so we've acquired a new company we have a new strategic plan um, it's like, mm, no, we don't, we don't change. We don't change that. That's, that's a fear-based training that's gone on inside your head, inside the culture. I think that makes me want to ask a couple of questions. So if I'm working in an environment, would I necessarily be aware that I'm in that kind of a fear-based environment by my reactions or by other, how might I have a red flag around that? Because I think sometimes when you're in something long enough, you don't necessarily notice it. Or yeah. You notice it right so away. True. That is so true. And um, one of the things that I have learned and now share with my clients is becoming much more aware of your body much more aware of the feelings and sensations in your body, much more aware of your thoughts. So if there's a lot of, I have to do this, there's a lot of negative negativity going on around you, the, the talk to yourself and amongst people um, is basically not nice. There's guilt and shame and harassing. You know that this is, there's a lot of fear here. If the conversation is positive, like, I want to do this. It's my idea. This might be scary, but I'm going to go through this because the consequences are not doing it. I don't want to face. That isn't a fear-based culture or thinking. So how would someone change? Um, I think one of the things you talked about a couple of times now since we've had this conversation is the internal dialogue, mm. right? So maybe you are the person putting the heaviness on yourself and it isn't necessarily a coworker or your work environment, but you are so self-critical whether you brought that with you or it's just so embedded and you're not even aware of it. What would be some of the things if I brought that to you, Angela, and said, I'm not, I'm not sure how to not do that. What, how might you help me? So there is, um, there are some steps that I think are very simple for people to um, make those changes. First of all is to breathe, to breathe better, to be more conscious of your breath. And as you breathe in a more regular way, it starts to regulate your body. And then um, another thing I encourage people to do is to make a practice of gratitude. Every day, write five things for which you're grateful. And these don't have to be big. If you look at mine, it's, um, I'm grateful that I had a good night's rest. Even though I might have been disturbed many times, I'm thinking, yeah, it was a warm bed or a cool bed, whatever the season is. I'm so glad the sun is up. Um, and it could be really the most basic, redundant stuff, um, repetitive stuff that I'm grateful for. As soon as I do that, then I change how my brain thinks. I now am in a much more creative space. Now, for many of us, we have some uh, voices or gremlins or characters in us that um, just won't go away. They just stick around. And one of the exercises that um, taught by uh, a friend of mine, Mark Herwick, is to actually have a conversation with these characters. And I write down, so um, I'm a recovering perfectionist. So um, I can't remember what I called it, but let's say it's Penny, Penny the perfectionist, right? Penny the perfectionist. Okay, you're yelling at me. What is it that you want me to hear? And I'm writing this down as a conversation. And it's usually like, I've been trying to protect you from this, that, and the other. And go, okay, okay. And go through all these characters. And a lot of these negative voices were there for protection. And they just got out of control. The, the prisoners took over the prison. As people start to integrate 
that part of themselves that they don't like, that's out of control, they start to feel more whole and in control. Yeah, so get into your body and befriend yourself. That's almost um, ironic, right? That if you can befriend yourself, the stuff that you've been protecting yourself from and accepting that and just having a conversation, right? Not trying to cram it away actually is the release. Yes, and sometimes it's the genius of yours that you, ha- that you hadn't um, acknowledged. Um, yeah, it's, it's like this character up, up in the attic that's making all of these scary noises, like let her out and come back and let her do her job. So if you could pick, I know this is hard because you have a big toolbox, but if you could pick one or two, one or two tools, or they might be processes like you just shared, um, mm-hmm. one or two of those things that might help um, one of our listeners, someone who's a leader, someone who's already highly successful, but just tired of that noise kind of thing, or wanting to have more congruence, mm-hmm. what might be a tool or a process you could suggest someone just do today? I think I, because I'm a process person, I'm going to say, take your hand and you know, you've got three digits on each finger and just breathe in and out and count on your fingers and just keep doing that through the day. Get into your body. Um, just that breathing. Make a habit of sitting down and um, writing five things for which you're grateful. If you have a problem to solve, write several things for which you're grateful. It might be the same things you wrote in the morning and then come to the problem. The problem won't have gone away, but you'll be in a much better position to solve the problem. And uh, especially for leaders, start practicing listening without judgment asking questions for which you don't know the answer. Now, sometimes you can ask questions like, which direction is the toilet? Yeah, there is, a, there is an answer to that. But when you're working with your colleagues, ask an open-ended question of something you generally want to know for which you don't have an answer. And you will start to hear things and learn things you didn't know. And your colleagues will start to thrive. I think that's a huge gem right there because it shows such um, like an honoring or a respect of somebody else's, like when you're asking genuinely interested, you're validating that they have yeah. something to contribute yeah. and you're not trying to figure out how they're right or wrong. You're just taking it in. And that person feels better and you feel better and you, you just, you feel better and you just function at a higher level. Just Especially if you keep breathing. Up. Yeah. It, it, it's so simple. And, and I we, love the writing down the, the things you're grateful for before you try to solve a problem. Yes. Um, because it really does. That's one of the things. I haven't tried it right before I've tried to solve a problem. But boy, whenever I'm like chewing on something where I'm going, ah, i got to figure this out. Rah, rah, or I'm grumpy about something. I'll just say, okay, just look up, look out around you, pick out some things in your environment, whether I'm indoors or outdoors, that you're happy about, right? Well, it's really hard to hold that thought and being grumpy simultaneous. You've got to pick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and who wants to go back to feeling grumpy when all of a sudden you're going, man, that's that tree is, oh, I didn't even know that hawk was there. You know, so it's, who wants to go back to feeling grumpy? Yeah. Exactly. And um, I've been told, and this works with me, I don't know if it works with everybody, is if you look above the horizon, just look up, it does something to your brain. You just start to feel better. And if you start to feel better, you think better. Yeah. So I'm going to, let's leave that as if you start to feel better, you think better. I think that's a huge takeaway. So Angela, where can people find you? Because I know our listeners are going to want to check you out, see what you're up to. So what's the best place for people to connect with you either on the internet or link, wherever you are? Okay, so um, I, my website is under construction. So LinkedIn is a good place, Angela Nesbitt. 
N-E-S-B-I-T-T. And um, my email is Angela at Jaziri. That's J-A-Z-I-R-I.com. And, and I welcome anyone that wants to continue this conversation. That'd be great. And I, I know you and I will be having future conversations yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. My friend on the other side of the country. <laughs> yeah. We will meet face to face one day. I believe we will. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure you just need to come out and see Lake Tahoe and then. Yes. Yeah. That'll work. That sounds wonderful. Sounds All wonderful. Right. Well, thank you so much for being our guest on the No Labels, No Limits podcast today, Angela. And I look forward to our audience getting to learn from you now and in the future. Oh, my pleasure. My honor. My honor. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's it for this week's edition of the No Labels, No Limits podcast. We hope you liked what you heard. And if you did, we ask that you go over to iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever else you listen to the podcast and leave us a rating and review. If you know someone who would enjoy this podcast, please be sure to share. And until next time, have a great week living a no labels, no limits, and no excuses life.